you, Peter, for such a grand introduction and details about my work. I'm also very grateful to the Orbach Institute for giving me this opportunity of working here with such good infrastructural support and the support of the colleagues for two months. Uh, it allowed me, through my discussions with Professor Marx, to think about a larger project which could be much more collaborative, wherein the exchange could be to learn more about the whole idea of representation of dreams, even in Western canonical or contemporary texts. And I'm looking forward to develop it as a future project with Professor Marx. So thank you, Professor Marx, for all these discussions. Uh, so for my presentation today, I offer to uh, initiate a conversation around social dimensions of dreams and dreamlike imaginations within the framework of staging of dreams by contemporary Indian feminist theater practitioners. Now, um, in our discussions, we spoke of how the stage, as much as the playing field, is marked by a clear distinction to its surrounding environment, and it is this difference that allows for a space of potentiality. When one is considering Indian performance space, can dreams on stage or equivalent states of consciousness be reduced to a psychological dream. I propose that a simple mapping of the same within the exemplar of Freudian psychoanalysis and unconscious with respect to dream interpretation can be reductive and counterproductive in the Indian context. What needs to be elaborated upon is how dreams are social imaginations which are shared, distributed, and discussed through the theatrical presentation and are often employed to understand social reality in broader historical and social contexts. The cultural balance given to dreams in the Indian plays need to be contextualized within the specificities of varied um, regional milieus, theatrical languages used, form being employed by the practitioners, political imaginations, performance sites, etc. I argue that in order to construct the contemporary reality, Indian feminist theatre directors are embracing this cultural model or non-Freudian tradition of the trope of dreams, visions, and they adapt it as their own in order to present, represent a different or an alternative dimension of reality, whereby the patriarchal rigid frameworks of performance practice and methodology are challenged. For example, as a, methodolo as, as a methodological tool, they put into practice the staging of dreams which are often drawn from folklore and mythology, the real dreams of people which can serve as their memoirs as well as testimonies are unconventionally archived in the productions. So visions, hallucinations, dreams all serve as a huge canvas of the depiction of very real possibilities and transformative as well as transgressive potentialities for their feminist interventions. Now, in order to further elaborate upon the processes of these feminist interventionist strategies devised by these women practitioners, it is imperative that I provide a brief political and historical overview of post-independence theatre sphere in the capital city of India, Delhi. Now, similar to uh, those of a number of post-colonial nations in the mid-20th century, post-independence Indian artists aimed to um, construct a new theatre free from the legacy of colonialism and reflecting key aspects of a new national identity. Now, in doing so, they followed modernity's project of the opportune amalgamation of tradition and folk forms with the sensibilities of the modern, inspired by the West, but also experimenting with the local creative idioms. The newly... <coughs> The newly independent state took the initiative in this context, as Partha Chatterjee puts it, to provide the official stamp of national modernity on various branches of cultural productions. The post-colonial state created institutions such as Sangeet Natak Academy and the National School of Drama to extend financial, infrastructural and pedagogical support to the theatre. The new institutional spaces were concentrated around the capital, Delhi, which had not experienced an earlier regional or colonial theater culture. As a result, the first directors deliberately engaged in a pedagogical process to create a new generation of citizen artists who would play an active role in civil society. An active theatrical public sphere would be an important democratic institution, while these ideal citizen artists would reflect the vision of the benevolent state. 
As an early example of this theatre, and I'm uh, giving you just an example so that I could focus on what are the feminist interventions and what were these women intervening with. So an early example of this theatre is the theatre of Ibrahim al Qazi, who worked in Bombay and was invited to develop guidelines for a fully-fledged curriculum for the new drama school and to take over as the director of the institution, which the National School of Drama, where he would remain till 1977. At the first All India Drama Seminar in 1956, convened by the National Academy for the Performing Arts, Al Qazi presented a landmark paper which bore some similarities to the drama curriculum of the British drama schools of the time, demonstrating in particular the influence of the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, as we all know as Radha popularly in London, where he had trained. Al Qazi's focus, for example, on the realist portrayal of life on uh, formalized gestures, on clarity of expression, authentic character creation, and minute and objective observation of reality understood, uh, underscored some of the ideological values through which he was endeavoring to evolve an identity that might reflect an Indian modernity to be written into the acting curriculum. Now, his production became spectacular theatrical events in the new post-independence modern theater of Delhi. His syllabus resulted in productions where the star male actors, carefully selected and nurtured through the drama school rigor, appeared as these larger-than-life individuals on stage, performing the roles of kings, emperors, noblemen, within a new Indian drama repertoire. Photographs, memoirs and reviews all emphasize these aspects as characteristic of his work. The two productions presented as exemplar of Al-Qazi's legacy one is the 1963 production Andhayu and the other 1972 production Tughlaq were performed at the Purana Kila and Firosha Kotla, two pre-colonial edifices located at the center of the capital. These performances became a key point uh, of reference for the inauguration of the post-colonial modern Indian theater. The curriculum based on his paper remained in place at the National School of Drama till 1988 and this is where my um, primary research comes into focus when Kirti Jain, one of these feminist theatre directors, was appointed as the school's first woman director. Now, under her leadership, a new syllabus was designed by the new faculty members who were predominantly women and who brought with them, as I see it, a distinctively gendered sensibility. My focus here is on the theatre created by women director in this space, whose interventions provided visibility to the women's experience of showcasing performance in this context. Starting in the late 1980s, several women directors who had occupied an ambivalent status both inside and outside amateur Delhi theatre practice took up permanent teaching positions at the National School of Drama. And uh, for the next two decades, Anuradha Kapoor, Kirti Jain, Maya Rao and Anamika Haksar amongst others, are the key players who designed and implemented <coughs> new actor training experiments at the school and influenced the theatre scene in Delhi in various ways. Now, in her writings, Anuradha Kapoor has mapped how these women changed the aesthetics of performance through innovative views of the female body on stage, new dramatic structures that stress collaborative and cooperative working processes, circular plots, non-linear <laughs> narratives, undoing dialogic communication, destabilizing gender norms, and upsetting gender hierarchies. Anamika Huxer, a faculty member there from 1990 to 98, is regarded as the most radical feminist director representing this group. Now, Huxer had studied both at the National School of Drama <laughs> as well as the Soviet Institute of Theatre Art in Moscow. So at the National School of Drama, she built on her Stanislavskian training, prioritizing the actor's exploration of interiority over externalization of the character set in the narrative. Her method marked a sharp shift from the actor training methods of the past. In her productions, she attempted to create a performance text based on long improvisation process, which included character role switching during rehearsals, Numerous workshops for the students to collectively devise the performance or production, abundant use of the body, consciousness raising, and innovative use of space. Her training in the USSR was seen as promoting progressive interpretation 
in terms of its socialist dramaturgy and the vision it promoted of the collective expressed through the dramaturgy's aesthetic idioms. Her intervention came with the focus of knowing yourself, rather uh, something subsequently stressed by many of her students, and this displaced, I argue, a monolithic vision of tradition as envisaged by her predecessors like al -Ghazi. Huxer took up the many strands that had evolved through the post-independence decades, such as the folk, the classical, the Western high bourgeoisie, the feminist and the cinematic and wove them together into what can be seen as a self-reflexive modernist idiom. Now in my presentation here on, I will concentrate on Huxer's practice and on two of her productions. One is called Antar Yatra, which can be loosely translated as an inner journey. Now this particular production is an adaptation and is based on Chilapatikaram, which is a Tamil epic attributed to a Jain poet, Elanga Adipal as well as her documentary style storytelling in her um, production, Taking the Horse to Eat Jalebis. So Jalebi is an Indian sweet and uh, I'm, I'm just giving you the translation, but the Hindi title is Ghore ko Jalebi Khilane Le Ja Raha Hu. Now in Indian drama and the various Indian traditions, the dream has a quality beyond the individual perception, which is programmatically non-Freudian. What I'm proposing is a post-colonial and a decolonizing provocation to think of non-Western, non-modern traditions of the dream in terms of what kinds of possibilities is the dream pointing to. Is it spiritual? Is it an alternate dimension? Is it just staging of desires? And so on. Uh, one thing is absolutely clear to me and is the argument that I'm putting forth that it is definitely non-Freudian. So Huxley's ability to stretch the boundaries of creative expression is best seen in her production, Antar Yatra, which was uh, produced in 1993. Also her collaborative, non-authorial and democratic pedagogy and process made her intervention stand out. Uh, this is just a quote from one of her students. The focus on the self and thereafter the use of individual experiences are among the prime pedagogical tools that she used in her uh, theatre practice. According to her students, she builds a bridge between critical thinking and real life situations to enable them to see the everyday world instead of a stereotypical perspective on that world. Students were made to learn martial arts, uh, were introduced to regional and oral histories of the context, images, metaphors and proverbs, and then were asked to improvise on them. Her approach to theatre training, honed by extensive work on her productions, made the pedagogic encounter a process of communication through which knowledge was communicated, contested, revised, appropriated, and even challenged. This enabled the student actors to create their own materials as the basis of the text to be performed, to perform personal narratives, and to reimagine their relation to performance and what it might mean in the social world. Now, in her work, contestation was central and her focus on improvisation was not exclusively on middle class life, but on the minutiae of the multiple regional specificities, identities and sense of belonging experienced by the people through the process conditioned by her um, actors and students. This paradigm, I argue, enables ways of thinking that are non-linear, associative, dialectical, and based on the process of layering. Antar Yatra was performed when communal tension was at peak in India. A 16th century mosque, Babri Masjid, was demolished by the mil militant Hindu nationalist groups, and riots between the majority Hindus and minority Muslim communities spread across the nation. Uh, the production tells a story of an ancient world where various religions coexisted in peace and harmony. The central narrative is the tale of the journey of three main characters through physical and metaphorical landscapes, which is symbolic of a dreamlike state. Kanagi and Kovalan are married, but their lives are disrupted by Kovalan's infatuation for Madhavi, a courtesan and accomplished dancer and singer. He later repents and starts afresh with his wife, but is mistakenly killed by the king. In her fury, Kanagi, the wife, confronts the king and curses the kingdom. Subsequently, she ascends to the domain of myth and divinity and is worshipped as a goddess. Now today, uh, Kanagi, 
who is the wife figure, is admired greatly in the Tamil world for her conjugal uh, devotion. Her appearance in the dream of a person is received as uh, auspicious and often her description is through dream narratives which are a collective experience within, a, within the local traditions. Haksar's Kanagi and Madhavi, however, did not fit into the normative traditional molds of the chaste wife and the courtesan as the other woman. And her interpretation of the two female protagonists is the feminist entry point into her dramaturgical intervention. On the stage, the characters of the two women emerge as mirror images of each other. Kanagi here is no longer a repressive model for female conduct. She tries to disrupt accepted gender roles and dissolves the boundaries between public and private, outer and inner selves. Her body movements are bold and she occupies the center stage quite often in the play. Many times she emerges with other women characters like the one etching patterns on the floor and you can see these are the kind of patterns that were being etched, bringing in a fluid presence on stage as well as her presence is like a vision which enables a questioning of the trope of the submissive wife. Therefore, I would like to highlight how the tradition of using such dreamlike states of presence, both in Indian literature like bhakti poetry as well as performance modes is what Huxa draws from here. However, she does so for her feminist creative praxis as well as political commitment to questioning normativity. Now, similarly in the production, Madhavi is shown as kind and a likable presence, in sharp contrast to the popular stereotype of a conniving, promiscuous courtesan. The play traces Kanagi's journey from silence to a questioning voice of pain and anger uh, to her exit in deification and acquire a dreamlike, a visionary presence on stage. The character of Kanagi, or the contrasting one of Madhavi, would have been the ideal roles to choose and portray conventional feminine archetypes. But through Huxa's treatment of uh, uh, presenting them as these visions, it becomes a means to deconstruct the feminine and their presence on stage becomes active sites wherein feminist politics can be enacted. Drawing from alternative modes of representation such as physical theater and diverse dance forms, so we see uh, coming together of Russian ballet, Rajasthani folk, traditional Tamil forms. She brought in oral visual motives that questioned the supremacy of the traditional text-based representational genealogies put forward by her predecessors like al -Ghazi. Now, Huxa's dramaturgy challenged a conventional linear, linear narrative, replacing it with a more disjointed and diffuse one to allow for several viewpoints to come into play. For instance, in the midst of the narrative, an actress would come center stage and sing Andal's poetry. The emphasis on unrealistic performance modes combined with fluid movements allowed her to explore the female body as female subject, that is, through moving bodies, and this was done while presenting these women occupying a dreamlike figuration on stage. She challenged the objectified inertness of the female body and thereby invested her female subjects with individuality. In the play, a Russian ballerina and many other dancers were performing the roles of spirits at the seashore, inhabiting the performance space without any dialogue. On stage, we see fictional and real characters intermingling, blurring the line between the visible and the imaginary. A new sensibility of the local and the regional, a focus on inhabiting the individual subject position, Rather than inflating the self, this is in contrast to the kind of production I spoke about with her predecessors like al -Kazi, and the portrayal of natural posture rather than larger than life gestures, these are some of the things that are characteristics of her work. Now, by creating a fluid performance panorama and staging dreamlike visions on stage, Huxa fragmented the proscenium stage and the eye of the spectator. The performance space extended beyond the circular canopy covered stage and into the larger outdoor spaces where the performances are usually staged. The audience was forced to see beyond that which it had become accustomed to watching. Now I just would like to show you a small two minute video of our recent film uh, Taking the Horse to Eat Jalebis which actually got its release in cinemas uh, last week.
So I saw it as part of a film festival and it has got amazing reviews though she had to go through a, a huge struggle to get a cinema release because of funding and other things which was expected but I hope that my paper further on and my discussion can just deconstruct or break this very small piece of the movie for all of you, but I'm going to try my best. Now, um, I'm quoting from Hannah Arendt, who says that the conception of human rise based upon the assumed existence of a human being as such broke down at the very moment when those who professed to believe in it were for the first time confronted with people who had indeed lost all of the qualities and specific relationships, except that they were still human. The world found nothing sacred in the abstract nakedness of being human. Hannah Arendt here argues that the consistent mistreatment of refugees, stateless homeless people, is evidence against the existence of human rights. If the notion of human rights as universal and inalienable is to be taken seriously, the rights must be realized irrespective of any ide other identity marker for them. However, this is never actualized, as several tensions and conflicts arise due to the growing divide between the haves and have-nots. Control of borders, as well as sanitization of city spaces, especially in the case of internal migration. The capital city of India, Delhi, witnesses migration of unskilled and semi-skilled rural population looking to improve their socio-economic status every year. Large portions of these individuals are forced to settle in extreme unhygienic clusters and are denied any basic human rights. Huxer takes up the lives of these very people as the canvas of her work taking the horse to eat jalebis. Now I seek to unravel the many layers that she weaves into the fabric of her film wherein she presents the social dimension of dreams and how being a veteran theatre director she brings forth an amalgamation of documentary style storytelling, magic realism, theatrical meta narrative, visual effects, literature, and folk art forms while delineating the lives, dreams, aspirations, and fears of the migrant inhabitants of Old Delhi. The production uh, can be seen as a riveting ode to the syncretic culture of Shah Jahanabad, which is the older name for Old Delhi. However, the gaze is not that of a privileged patronizing observer. Huxer in the film, employing the grammar of theatre, brings out the human stories amidst the fading memories of history, identities, and a sense of belonging with the changing landscape of the city by what she calls as urban smog. It is interesting to read how she juxtaposes the real dreams of people through an unconventional archiving in the performances on screen. She's quite successful in adapting the skill sets of people from the theatre to the cinema screen. Her protagonists take us on performative excursions with elements of folk theatre, theatrical realism, psychological acting and physical theatre to give an insight into the mindscape of street artists, vendors, destitute petty criminals who have been dehumanised by popular narrative conventions that rely on causations, climaxes and resolutions. The director uses the theatrical exercise processes used during rehearsals as part of the screenplay. With the backdrop of once August and affluent settlement of Old Delhi crumbling under the current paradigm of development, Huxa provides a scathing critique of the country's socio-political scenario in this collaborative endeavor. Collecting memories and archiving dreams. An understanding of Zizek's formulation on migration that until the rich world thinks one world, migration will intensify and the divide will grow. Can, can be seen reflected poignantly in this production by Haksa. She and her team extensively worked and documented lives, stories, memories and dreams of people inhabiting the streets of Old Delhi. To archive these oral histories in India is a necessary imperative for an artist like Haksa who believes that to have a public voice is to understand the society we inhabit and act in as citizens and historical agents. Now, in order to challenge and break the complacent, stereotypical treatment of the lives of the people on the streets, she turns to memories and specifically to the dreams of the very inhabitants 
archiving their dreams and memoirs through the performing bodies of our four main characters, serving what Knowles would call as documentary. Now, all four of them, on one hand, solicit the fictional character type ascribed to them, and on the other, through their gestures, movement, dance, and song, draw on their bodily archive, uh, signifying the larger community they belong to, over and beyond highlighting the social hierarchies of privilege and disprivilege. The performative body then becomes a repertoire of movements, gestures, tactile practices, and can be examined as an active site for the production of a memoir. It produces a counter memory to the worn out conventions, which is more truthful to the experience of the migrants. The narrative timeline, sound dialogue, movement, not even the dreams are linear and singular here. Every coordinate clashes with each other and creates a multi-dimensional visual for the audience. One man's dreams often infringe upon others' mind and enter his dreamscape, thereby creating conflict and flutter. For example, the first frame, which we also saw in the video, is that of an animated goddess Lakshmi throwing marigold flowers over a dreamer's face. However, a giant red communist flag being held by another laborer in his dream, recreating the epochal image of the Russian Revolution, pokes her and enters the first person's dream. Now the two wake up and they stir up quarrel. They start fighting with each other. They blame each other that why did you come into my dream? You know, you just spoiled it for me. And as you saw in the video, it highlights the collective and shared aspect of dream that I'm talking about. And um, these individuals, they are not overwhelmed by a dream in the modernist discourse as it happens. Rather, they are invoking these dreams almost programmatically to understand a certain situation, thereby giving it a social quality. We see dreams centering on subjects like homosexuality, homelessness, a desire to belong, death, figures, and, and figures like that of a holy cow, snakes, fires, corpses wrapped in white cloth suspended midair, and even a Mickey Mouse makes an appearance therein. We see carp pullers dream of green forests and calm, soothing sound of water, in contrast to the monotonous drudgery of their real world. Huxer's handling of these cryptic dreams collected from real people is imaginative, innovative, and pushes the boundaries of storytelling by a coalescence of realism, surrealism, and symbolism here. She makes use of animation and visual effects, unlike the standard conventions, spread out uh, in the midst of characters portraying the story on screen and the documentary footage are animations drawn from folk art, Madhubani paintings, mythology, uh, and history. The traditional sleek commercial Western animation and effects are abandoned for a raw, fantastical, and I, what I would like to call as a personal and affective portrayal of the aspiration, longings, furthermore, the dreams of people which are communal rather than individual. The sound used in the production is ambient sound. Nothing is dubbed in a studio and it makes the visuals come alive on the screen. A laborer working in a high decibel area is recorded very, uh, without any noise cleaning. Industrial sounds are used synchronically and tangentially. Thereby, uh, it is a theater-like experience which she brings to the stage or to the screen because of her experience in theater. Now, coming from the theatre milieu, she brings this experimentation as part of the screenplay of the movie, which creates a stage-like immediacy, relativity, and seems like an unconventional theatre performance. There are these long takes on the roofs of the homes, where main characters are shown to gather together and eat after day's work. It is in this vocabulary of theatre that we can see her working with the pauses, the crane shots, the non-verbal annunciation through the body of the actors in this particular performance. Interesting is also her work process, wherein her training and years of experience in theatre is what makes use of, uh, what she makes use of as her primary tool. In terms of the research, for seven years she worked amongst people labouring in Shah Janabad. Beggars, pickpockets, loaders, wedding bands, small-scale factory workers, street singers and vendors interviewing and getting questionnaires filled by them. Each dream sequence, each 
and every fragment of dream showcased in the movie is taken from the anecdotes shared by them. So she had devised this questionnaire, but she kind of continued with the process for almost seven years, collecting, asking, questioning people about their dreams. Hakser has often worked in the unorganized sectors for her plays, and I quote, she says, it awakened in me an understanding of the multiplicity of the lives in the city of their dreams. And I close quotes. She has forever worked in a non-hierarchical and collaborative structure. Here too, she works with people as active co-creators rather than passive inheritors. She brings in several non-profit organizations, street people's unions representatives and night shelter volunteers. Her actors were a mix of those trained at the drama school like the National School of Drama, together with 350 known artists from these very streets. And she has recently, last week, done a grand production where she actually went to the streets of Shah Jahanabad, Old Delhi, and on these huge um, projector screens has uh, showcased her movie just for them who cannot get access to theater releases. She conducted several workshops with these non-actors, an experience which she calls as a learning curve for her training, trained actors and herself. Staging the City, A Walk to Remember. Kim Solga, in her book, Performance and the City, talks about the role theater and performance play in rethinking about the metaphor of the city as a text beyond that urban studies enable. This is what Huxer does when she makes us follow the daily hustle of these people living in the twilight between real and dream, through the narrow maze of the lanes in Old Delhi. The storyline juxtaposes two different types of walks through the city space, which we also saw in the video, that how people were talking about that instead of just a heritage walk, let's, let's do a real walk of the real Delhi. A typical heritage walk through old Delhi exemplifies the city as a cauldron of art, culture, historical landmarks, traditional food drawings, lineage from the Mughal kitchen, all wrapped up in the exotic packaging of the subaltern history. The city store stage urbanism for consumption by the tourists. Huxa here punctures and deflates this flamboyant performance by bringing in elements of black humor, magic realism, and play with language together with the actor's body. The city guide, played by Lokesh Jain, is presented as a Urdu Persian aficionado together with a penchant for poetry of Delhi-based poetic giants like Ghalib, Dag, and Mir. He's shown taking the urban middle class elite as well as overseas tourists on a magic carpet for a fairy tale peregrination. While he idealizes the age old heritage of old Delhi to his visitors, the garbage filled stinking drains shown in the background makes the irony even more poignant. What the director wants to focus on in contrast is the old Delhi's underbelly, footpath populated with the homeless bodies, migrants working in inhumane conditions, History of the space fading and obliterating in the memories and dreams of the dwellers. Here she brings in Patru. Now this is one of the characters of the four central characters, played by Ravindra Sahu, who is shown as a pickpocket with dreams of being a musician. Haksar allows each of her actors to work and develop their own individual style and brings together a symphony of various affectations for the spectators in the performance. For example, Sahu, who is a well-known actor of the Delhi stage trained at the National School of Drama, is seen here delving into his intense psychological interior and thereof physical theatre as he gives life to the character of the homeless Patro, questioning the biases and exposing the middle class hypocrisy with a subversive humour. Making use of gr uh, Grotowskian technique, which is basically physiological resonators, he comes across as one of the most hard-hitting performers of the production. We see him talking to the audience directly and narrating the story of his love interest. He decides to take the tourists on an alternative walk, wherein he would show them the real people of the people of this part of the city. These tourists had signed to see the city's glorious past as they walked through Chandni Chowk, Sadar Bazaar, lanes of some of the busiest and most congested markets in the city of Delhi, which in the popular imagination are the quintessential oriental part of the city with ornate minarets, bustling bazaars, and a maze of narrow winding lanes. They are often seen in contrast to the grand architecture, bold, authoritarian, and elegant design of modern New Delhi. However, what Patru manifests for them is the city, uh, is the city as far more fragmented, 
breaking the picturesque view of it as exotic and timeless. A participant to his walk, he's appalled at the field that Pakthru lays out to them, shows her superliciousness at being exposed to the harsh reality of these little people. Like the story, so Pakthru gives him like anecdotes while he's being the travel guide here of a man who was beaten to death in the jail. And, um, and, and, and the tourists respond, this is not the story I want. The so-called little people can be understood through Sarah Emmett's theoretical framework of the bogus. Now, in order to identify and assert one sense of belonging, it seems to have become imperative, especially in an urban setup, to identify with a collective uh, which is macroscopically suspicious of the migrate bodies occupying the city space. The good citizen is invited to become the eyes and the ears of the police and look out for strangers to identify and point out the others, those who are bodies out of place. Now, Patru is often chased by a police officer who is informed of him being the outsider, hence dangerous, the stranger danger, as Ahmed puts it. The good citizen is shown to champion initiatives like Clean Delhi, Green Delhi, wherein Seva Kutir vans forcefully dump these people outside the city borders in order to cleanse the space. And Patru's walk unmasks the veil of welfare from their faces when the visitors are nauseous of witnessing such biopolitics. Now, the second character that comes across is Gopalan. He's a renowned theatre artist from Kerala and he gives life to the character of Lal Bihari, a loader and a labourer activist who dreams of the red flag swaying to the communist anthem. In a very powerful sequence, we see him carrying a very heavy load, wherein the camera zooms in on every muscle in his body, breaking under the duress and pressure of poverty, heat and urban trauma. Haksa moves away from realism and brings in Kupal's theatrical strengths, that is yoga, kalari, and dance to the fore. Kupalan, with his non-conformist body language and expressions, brings the whole idea of the labor that goes into it to the spectators. Nevertheless, he is immediately in the next shot, shot shown as fantasizing and dreaming of his exploited shop owner turning into a helpless lizard in a jar. So, you know, whenever such kind of dreams that these laborers or people working in the poorest of condition would be showcased on the cinema screen, we, we got a collective laughter from the audience with a certain kind of relatability of their dream scenarios. Making use of the technique of excess and exaggeration, Haksa shows him and Patru dream of themselves as powerful wrestlers, combating with the brutal policemen and shop owners. The landscape of labor and toil is shown to have a subterranean dreamscape too. This, I believe, is far removed from what one would categorize as Freudian interpretation of dreams. My reading, therefore, is a programmatic, de-essentializing and historicizing of dreams, reading them as a specific form to create a sphere of potentiality that is not instrumental and subjected to an explicit, uh, explicit will, but allows for inner development and dynamics. The movie doesn't draw the viewer into any kind of identification leading to a cathartic expulsion. Haksa, with her sharp feminist aesthetic and political sensibilities, gives voice and visual to lived experiences. She has never shied away from expressing her opinion on the country's socio-political milieu. Here, she makes scathing comments on the documentation for the poor migrant laborers, tribal lands in places like Jharkhand being usurped for commercial ventures, changing the names of the roads in Delhi based on religious affiliations, and the inconsiderate Beggars Act in which the government has classified all street performers as beggars, thereby destroying their livelihood and survival mechanism. Now, by highlighting the marked physical changes, that is social, economic, and political restructuring, the transformations that occur due to a disarray of synchronic activities like demolishing and building, disclaiming and appropriating, redefining and abandoning res respectively, Hapsa brings the synosure upon how these urban spaces faced with internal migration need to be understood as rapidly changing, constantly adapting, throbbing and vibrating with a constant influx of people by looking at their everyday life events rather than large cultural or historical narratives. She makes the audience see how the Havelis, uh, Kuchas, and the Katra system 
though now commercialized and rebuilt, remain vibrant even in their dilapidation only when seen from the eyes, dreams and heard through various languages and dialects of these very people. Drawing from James Thompson's Aesthetics of Care, Huxer prioritizes relationality and interdependency wherein the participants and the art making process is intrinsically linked. It is her feminist aesthetics of care, her affective solidarity, which enables her to show the migrant figures as resilient and optimistic in spite of their miserable and marginalized life in the spiral of urban apathy. She presents their scuffle with life without any romanticization, though with utmost attentiveness to its delineation. The film celebrates the dreams, dignity, courage, empathy, and compassion of people inhabiting the bleakest spaces. The concluding scene is that of children of the area creating music using old tin cans and glass bottles, their music reaching out and enveloping the entire region with a bright, shiny light, filling it with color, hope, melody, searing high up into the sky. She has archived the dreams which others in their isolated spaces like institutional and urban Delhi could not do, both aesthetically and in terms of dealing with the subject. Her work has far more potential in combining the gender exploitation with the socio-economic one and has a reach to enable a real change. Through her work as an example, I propose a deeper questioning of, of how Freud is also part of the hegemonic discourse. All the reformations of Freud or the reconsideration of psychoanalysis remain a Western hegemonic concept. How desire is defined, how the unconscious is defined, it is all part of the modernist discourse. I'm not saying it's not important or should not be studied, and I think I'm grateful to Freud to start this discussion for all of us when he did. But the question is that how does the concept of dream as a culturally specific concept allows for different kinds of definitions of visions, visualities, but also how it relates to the individual vis-a-vis -vis the society. The representation, staging of dreams in the vast heterogeneous and varied Indian traditions cannot be tamed into the Freudian category of reality versus dream, whether manifest or latent. Dream has a social dimension, and as Huxa Movies has pointed out as an example, it's not psychoanalysis of these individual people, but is really creating a space for possibilities or potentialities by making this dreamlike space community-based. Thank you.